So welcome to the Midday Connect, uh, December 5th. We're grateful for our sponsors um, and glad to have Wayne with us. Um, I got a, a little bit familiar with Wayne uh, before we broke, went to the breakout rooms. So I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, about his experience. And um, so without further ado, Wayne, we'll kick it over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on uh, the program today. I really appreciate it. Let me share my screen with you and we'll do a little uh, fun presentation for, uh, I don't know how long you're going to give me, but I'll try to make it quick. Um, how do you exit rich? I mean, am I going to be able to tell you that in 15 minutes? Um, as, as they say, NFW, there's no way I can do that. But I'll give you some tidbits from my book that I wrote and published, uh, released it in May of 2023, and it's it's known as your multi-million dollar exit, the Entrepreneur's Business Succession Planner, um, which really is all about how to build an exit plan. Uh, it gives you ideas uh, on the estate planning front. It gives you ideas on the business planning front and on business succession planning. So I encourage you to get it. It's not short. It's 365 pages long, but it has my 37 years of experience as an attorney and 43 as a CPA and working with entrepreneurs and trying to help them build toward their multi-million dollar exit. And I've been involved in uh, probably 160 plus sale transactions for my clients over my career. Today, we're going to talk about three things, anticipating and minimizing the risk of unexpected events like death and disability. How do you identify and navigate the rough patches that inevitably we all face when we're starting and running and growing our business? And then we'll talk about assembling a good team of people. I, not just good, excellent team, a superior team, a team of people that can help you maximize your exit, the value of your exit. <clears throat> So what do I mean by unexpected? You know, the the proverbial milk truck is going to come along one day. There are, there are no milk trucks anymore, so I'm, I'm dating myself. But, you know, a bus, a car, you get hit by a car, something bad happens to you, you have a stroke, you have a heart attack, God forbid. That's an unexpected event. None of us can plan for that kind of stuff. I had cancer at the age of 43. I'm 65 today. But, you know, at 43 with four young kids and a wife who was staying at home raising the kids... Um, it was a devastating event. And how do you plan for that? So the idea is to try to think about the unexpected events that could occur to you, but more importantly, not dwell on that, come up with contingency plans. And I'm going to give you some thoughts that not too many people use when they are uh, doing their uh, uh, planning for the unexpected events. First of all, one of the things I recommend that entrepreneurs do is develop what's called a management succession plan. It's not just a plan, it's a binding contract like bylaws are in a corporation that binds the corporation or your entity, your LLC, and the owners and the family to a single plan that tells us how are we going to operate the business on a day-to-day -day basis if something happens to me or something happens to you as the founder. Who's going to step in and run finance? sales and marketing, HR, you know, manufacturing, operations, you name it. Who is the person or people that are going to do this? And then what assurance can you give them that they'll have a job if something happens to you so that they don't run away and try to get a new job somewhere else and leave the company basically exposed? That's what a management succession plan is designed to do. In addition, you want to have an oversight of the day-to-day -day managers. I'll give you a quick story, and this will illustrate why. I had a client who uh, became very sick, and he was running a contracting business here in the D.C. metro area, Washington, D.C. metro area, and it was very successful. It was generating 40 to $50 million a year in revenue, and very profitable. But he was the guy. He was the person who was the CEO, and he pretty much managed everything. He had people working under him. Um, he got sick. He designated his chief financial officer as the person who was going to run the business. And that was it. And then he tried to recuperate. A year later, he got better. He came back into the business and he discovered not only had the business declined to under 30 million in revenue, but he found out that the CFO was diverting business 
to a competing entity that the CFO had an ownership interest in. How do you protect yourself from that? Well, you can set up a board of directors or a board of managers or a management committee in the management succession plan. And you may say, I only want this to come into play if I become incapacitated. But you can also start now by having a board of managers or a board of directors, or maybe just a board of advisors. The book gets into all the detail about that stuff, so I won't bore you with that today. But a management succession plan is a telling us who the day-to-day -day operators are going to be, what their compensation is going to be, what they're able to do and what they're not able to do, and who's going to oversee them to make sure that we don't have any problems like I just described. And then if there's a desire to sell the business, who has the authority to do that? Linked closely to the management succession plan is a business continuity instruction. Who does your family call if something happens to you? Who's the first person they should call? Are there advisors that are already advising the family, such as a, an attorney or a CPA or a, a business advisor? Who will you contact? And who will then be in charge of notifying the employees at the company? And what's the communication plan? That's what business continuity instructions get into. They also talk about who is currently involved in the company, who the main customers are, and how to get in touch with them and who should be in touch with the customers in the event that something happens to the key founder or key person who's running the business. What happens if you have an accident? Is your spouse the person that's going to run this business? Or is it somebody else that you're going to name to work with the spouse to make sure that the family is protected? Is there a salary continuity plan so that if something happens to you and you're not working, can your family still receive benefits from the company? Not just healthcare benefits, but salary and cash flow. All of these things are covered in business continuity instructions, which again are linked closely to the management succession plan. And then last but not least, everyone needs an estate plan. And you, you go, well, that's just a will, right? And the answer is no. We want you to have a revocable trust to own your business. Why? If you own your asset, your business, uh, outright in your own name, and then you die, it's going to go through a system called probate in order for it to uh, transition to the next person in line, to your wife, to your husband, to your kids, to a, a family uh, member that's going to run the business. And it may take time and it's going to cost a lot of money. You can avoid all of this by using a revocable trust of which you are the trustee and you're in control from the beginning. But if something happens to you, you've named a successor to basically step in and run things if something happens. Now, does that mean you're automatically going to name a spouse to do that? Can the spouse come in and handle the rigors of making decisions about running the business as an owner? They may not be involved in the day-to-day -day management, but they may have to make some key decisions. So you may be thinking about appointing somebody to serve alongside your spouse or your partner as a business trustee in your trust, or a committee of people that can help advise your family and do the right thing. And the final piece of all of this is that the management succession plan, the business continuity instructions, and the estate plan all need to be linked together. If they're not linked together, whoever you've named as the trustee or executor of your estate basically can come in and thwart all your wishes by firing everybody that you've named to run the company in the management succession plan. So link it all together, have it coordinated. So you're going to need an estate planning attorney as well as a business attorney involved to help you do these things. The second thing I wanted to talk about is identifying and navigating rough patches. And of course, there's many ways that we can experience rough patches. Technology changes are abundant today. The EV industry taking over the automobile industry, artificial intelligence basically scaring the heck out of everybody, but also it's an opportunity, an opportunity to plan ahead. So as a business owner, you should anticipate the changes that are coming down the pike by doing your research, having a contingency plan, and then having a way of adapting so that you can morph to that contingency plan. Economic changes are prevalent. 
interest rates have gone way up in the last two years from 1% to over 5% on the treasury yield. And we're talking about eight, nine, 10% borrowing if you're borrowing it from a lender or a bank or, or a private equity firm. It's expensive to borrow money. What are your plans to raise capital if you need capital, if you don't have access to the banks because the interest rates are too high? Political changes. If the Democrats are able to retain control of the presidency and the, and the Senate and then gain control of the House, things are going to look very differently than they would if the Republicans were to control the presidency and the Congress. And so you have to sort of, okay, if this happens, this is what I'll do. If that happens, this is what I'll do. It's building a plan and then being adaptable to it. Industry changes are abundant. You might have a, com a competitor or competitors uh, appear uh, suddenly because of something great that you may have done in your industry that's unique. Uh, developing new apps or whatever that allows for people to do things in your industry that they couldn't do before and you haven't anticipated, you've got to be able to morph to those changes. And lastly, who can predict what will happen with a pandemic? I had this experience myself. I was practicing as a, uh, a CPA, and then I got out and I uh, went to law school uh, for three years. And when I got out of law school, I was a tax attorney at that time. And the Tax Reform Act of 1986 began winding its way through Congress. It started in 1984. And you could see the writing on the wall that they were going to shut down tax shelters. And so I was involved in my first year of practicing law with a big law firm. I was involved in working on real estate tax shelters, which are fewer and further between today because of changes in the law that came about. So I basically adapted and morphed and did other things, including estate planning, which is part of what my practice consists of today. The last piece, the last piece, and then I'll turn it over to everybody to start asking questions. I see there are a bunch of questions, I think, in the chat room. We'll go to that in a second. Is assembling a superior team to help you get from the 20 yard line over the goal line. I like football analogies, even though my football team in this area is really horrible. Um, so the idea is, you know, who's going to get you over there? If you're the quarterback and you're the offensive line and you're the wide receiver and you're everybody, you're going to have a hard time getting past the San Francisco 49ers defense or the Philadelphia Eagles defense. You want to have a plan and a team that is able to get you over the goal line. So the first person that I always recommend that you contact is a financial planner. If you're an owner or an entrepreneur, get a financial planner to ascertain what your assets are outside of the business. Do you have enough life insurance? Do you have outside investments other than your retirement assets? And what are your retirement assets? And are they enough to carry you through to age 123, like people are predicting you all are going to live until? I won't live that long, but you all may live that long. And so the question is, what financial planning have you done without the business and with the business? Part of this analysis then will involve valuing your business. You know, you, you hear rumors about my competitor sold for X times earnings. Well, that may or may not apply to you, and it may or may not be the, the applicable multiple that you can use for your business. So getting somebody who's a valuation expert, not a financial planner necessarily, but a valuation expert to help you value the business today, figure out what your value gaps are so that you can fill them and have a successful exit tomorrow. Another group of people that I always recommend that my clients talk to are investment bankers. Your company may be way too small to be talking to an investment banker today or even a business broker, but you can gain a lot of knowledge and start developing relationships with these people and they can refer talented individuals to you in different aspects of your industry. So finding out who the key investment bankers are in your industry is a good thing to do and having lunch with them or dinner or coffee and getting to know them and getting them to know you and help, having them mentor you towards an exit is a great way to build your business. Same thing with good business brokers. There are business brokers who are out there just to sell your company and generate a commission. And then there are others like the investment bankers who want to invest in you and invest in your growth and see you succeed so that they can su succeed in the end. Of course, you always have to have an attorney involved. An estate attorney is going to help you draft your revocable trust. The uh, 
uh, tax lawyer is going to help you structure your exit. The corporate lawyer is going to help you with your management succession plan. Fortunately, I do all three, but I, I can't do everything for everybody. And we bring in outside counsel all the time. ERISA counsel for benefits, environmental experts, product liability experts. It depends. Securities law experts. It all depends on what your business is and what expertise you need to fulfill your goals. And then CPAs and accountants are critical. Who prepares your taxes and do they know what they're doing? Are they helping you with planning towards that exit? A good CPA firm is going to be a critical part of the rock star team that you need to have a successful exit. And lastly, believe it or not, your insurance advisors are critical. It's not just about life insurance. It's also about getting a good property and casualty insurance advisor to help analyze your risks in the business and help you structure your business so that you can mitigate those risks. That doesn't mean just buying insurance. It's finding good insurance advisors who can help you understand what the risks are in your business and help you structure uh, your business to minimize those risks. So the, everybody works as a team. And if everybody collaborates with each other, it can be an extremely successful teamwork effort to get over that goal line. So again, a lot of this is covered in great detail in my book, and you can get it on Amazon. Also, uh, I do business exit planning through my firm, Aspire to Exit. So if any of you ever want to know more about that and how to architect your ultimate exit plan, I'd love to help you with that. I don't know if I'm over time or under time, but I'll bet there's a bunch of questions. That was perfect. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, I have a question out of the gate. Um, can you talk for a minute about uh, a few specific common mistakes or common phrases you hear from people that say, I wish I would have known this earlier? I hear that all the time. I hear it every, every time I meet a new client, they come to me, especially the ones that are getting ready to sell their business. And they right. say, I'm ready to sell my business. And I say, okay, what have you done to prepare to sell your business? Well, what do you mean? That's the next question I usually get. And the answer is, well, there's a lot of things that you need to do to prepare, not only from a legal perspective, but from a financial perspective. So for example, if you're going to sell your company for $20 million or up, and you really want to maximize the value, having a good accounting firm involved in preparing your financial statements on a gap basis, generally accepted accounting principles, is really important because the buyer is usually going to bring in another accounting firm to do what's called quality of earnings analysis. And when they do that Q of E analysis, they're looking at every aspect of your financials and the cleaner your financials are and the better prepared you are for that, the, 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 the more likely it is that you're going to be able to maximize your value. So that's just one example, but there's so many different examples of how you can prepare in advance, including on an estate planning perspective. So if you end up thinking that you're going to be selling your business for 40 million or 50 million after taxes, you're going to need some advanced estate planning, which we use several techniques to minimize gift and estate taxes for your family. God forbid something happens to you down the road. So there's lots of different things that you need to think about in pre-transaction planning. Okay. Question from Nathan. Uh, I assume you're mainly preparing these plans for founders and small business owners. Are the exits you're referring to primarily to financial buyers or strategic buyers? Um, it's not just small businesses. I work with clients. I have one client right now. They're preparing to exit in about three years. They're a government contractor. Um, they're owned by two main individuals, and then they have a series of uh, uh, smaller shareholders that were given shares as uh, they grew the company. And they're going to, their, their, their ballpark exit uh, strategy is to sell for more than a hundred million dollars. So that, I wouldn't call that a small business, but it's more of a mid-sized business. Um, but the idea is, uh, you, you know, preparing for that is, is critical. The, uh, uh, Repeat the question one more time, just to make sure I'm I'm answering the question because I can go off on tangents. Yeah. So uh, the exits are they primarily for financial buyers to, to strategic yeah. buyers? So uh, no. I mean, w one of my clients wants to sell to a young man that is going to step in and run his company and be the CEO. So their management buyout considerations. Number one. Number two. Um, if the management doesn't have the money to afford it, 
Can they get outside financing to help them finance it? Number three, could you do an ESOP to help uh, afford the purchase and, and structure it in a way that's very tax efficient and tax effective? Number four, you may have a private equity buyer that comes in or fi you know financial buyer that comes in to buy. And number five, a lot of my sales have been to strategic buyers over the years. Um, what you what you typically do if the if the sale price is going to be large enough, say over 25, 20, 25 million, where you want to bring in an investment banker, they're going to open their Rolodex not only to strategic buyers in your industry, but also private equity buyers, family offices. And they may even uh, advise you on a management buyout structure where financing can be raised. So all of those things are part of the uh, exit plan. It's discussed in, in length in my book. So, Wayne, of all of the circles that you put up on that last slide, which one should people be talking to first? You mean in terms of the advisors, the yeah. team? I, when you're doing exit planning, by the way, you should you should start as Stephen Covey always says, you know, start at the beginning. Uh, your plan at the beginning, your exit plan should be from the very beginning. You're thinking, well, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm just starting up my business. I don't have time to focus on that. Well, you do. You want to have time to focus on your business as well as working in your business. So, to me, having a financial planner at your side from the beginning is important. Um, very important. Having a good CPA at your side, having a good tax advisor at your side at the beginning. So choosing choosing the right form of entity is something I end up helping clients, you know, structure because I'm a tax guy, and so I, I end up, you know, telling them, well, you don't really want to use an S corporation here for what you're thinking about. You may want to just be an LLC taxed as a partnership, or it depends on if you're going to be raising outside capital, or if you're a technology company, you may want to be a C corporation so that you can qualify for the qualified small business stock exclusion under section 1202 of the internal revenue code, which allows you to avoid long-term capital gain on up to 10 million. And then I can show you how to leverage that $10 million. So there's lots of different uh, techniques and lots of different people you want to get involved. But I think the first people would be the financial planners, insurance, and uh, CPA tax people involved. And what what would you say the general, like if you're a startup and an entrepreneur, you said that you should have those people in your pocket or by your side. How much should entrepreneurs be paying those advisors and service providers? Yeah, I mean, Attorneys are really expensive these days. Good ones are really expensive because the rates have just been going through the roof. The large firms charge over $1,500 an hour to represent you know, individuals in New York and Washington, D.C. Uh, I don't charge that level, but I'm not, I'm not an expensive. So usually it's an hourly rate. You can often get a fixed fee. So we do our estate planning on a fixed fee so you know exactly what it's going to cost and you can budget for that. Um, and I like fixed fee arrangements because of that, because clients really like it. And they don't want to be billed for a you know 10 minute telephone conversation, right? So I take a lot of telephone calls. I don't bill for that. And I think I think people like that. What should you be paying your insurance advisor? Nothing. They they get commissions on the sale of products. Now, if you're hiring an insurance person who's just selling you a product and they're not helping you evaluate your risk, then that's a big mistake. So I think having a good insurance advisor around you to help you analyze your risk. What kind of business are you in? Are you in cybersecurity? Are you handling private information of individuals? What must you do to protect the individuals, the customers, and your business from liability, not just buy insurance? And so it, it's getting good advisors who are going to give you good advice and really care about you. So the cost of the of the advisor you know, you get what you pay for too. You can hire people that can do a revocable trust for you for $1,500, uh, or you can do it on LegalZoom.com, but you get what you pay for. And so caveat emptor, buyer beware, you got to be very careful about who you're talking to about these things. So I think it really depends. Thanks, Taylor. Wayne, um, can you talk about preparing for due diligence and what, uh, what a founder can do to prepare for due diligence with a potential buyer? So what I do is I send them a due diligence checklist that we would expect the buyer to send them. 
And so that's the first thing. And then they look at it and they go, I don't have all this stuff. And the and the the, the, the answer is, well, yeah, I know you don't have all this stuff, but what do you have? Because I don't know your business well enough to basically identify it. So it's sitting down with an exit planner or your attorney, your corporate attorney, whoever, to go through a checklist that a buyer will provide to you based on your industry and then create a data room that has all of the relevant pieces that you would normally provide to the buyer or buyer's counsel in a due diligence process. So build your data room ahead of time. I can tell you, if you do that and you secure it, obviously you want it to be very secure. You don't want it to give it, give it to every potential buyer. You narrow it down. There's a process that you go through in order to do that. But you build your data room and you populate it accurately with all of your signed contracts and all of your tax returns all of your filings with the DOL and the IRS and the state governments, and you have all of that ready, and then you keep it up to date as you go along, the buyer is going to be blown away by that. They're going to, they're, the amount of due diligence that they will have to do will be decreased and their comfort level will be increased. And I got to tell you, that that's what I always tell people when we're preparing for exits. If we have to do due diligence, Let's do it before they start doing due diligence on us. Let's get everything in line. The other thing is, I, you know, a client asked me the other day, should we do our own quality of earnings analysis? If you've had a CPA working with you, preparing your financials and doing it on at least a review basis or even an audited basis, um, you don't need a Q of E, but you need to make sure your books and records are in really good condition and that you've got a good financial person in-house who can uh, answer questions that come up in the analysis of quality of earnings as, as it progresses. So making sure that you've got all that stuff buttoned down, your corporate records buttoned down, you've got minutes and consents that back up key corporate actions that you've taken. All of these things should be taken in advance and just getting your lawyer in to uh, do some preliminary uh, review on that is really important. And if your lawyer is a litigator or your lawyer is a specialist in government contracting or real estate or is just a general practitioner, you're going to need somebody who's had experience with mergers and acquisitions and somebody who knows what the buyer is going to be looking for and then how to respond to it when they come uh, peeking under the kimono, so to speak. Question from uh, Mike Rich uh, about the value of assembling a, an advisory board um, and who should be on it. And what's the size? How many people? Like-mindedness versus, and I'll, I'll, I'm expanding on his question, versus uh, different points of view or perspectives. Great, great question. Um, we do advisory boards for clients. Um we don't always assemble the team on the advisory board because it really depends on the company. So having people that are like-minded, meaning that they share your values and they want you to succeed is where I would start, um, number one. Number two, having somebody that has been through a successful exit in your industry is also a valuable tool to have on your advisory board. Um, having different disciplines on the advisory board, people who can add to your marketing capability or you know sales capability, who can help you identify customers, particularly in the government sector where I spend a lot of my time with clients. Um, having people with, uh, with financial acumen who have helped clients exit. How many people on the advisory board? Maybe it's two, maybe it's five. But what I've seen about also in, in terms of advisory boards is you assemble the board, you meet a couple of times, everybody sits around, throws out their ideas, and then disappears. What skin in the game do they have? Have you given them some kind of equity or synthetic equity in the form of phantom stock or maybe a change in control bonus to incentivize them to be part of it? Are you paying them for their time? All of these things are factors in building an advisory board. Remember, an advisory board is not a fiduciary board. Board of directors is. So that raises the bar. When you create a board of directors, then you're going to need to get directors and officers insurance. And these people are fiduciaries with a fiduciary obligation, duties of loyalty and care and prudence to the shareholders and the creditors of the company. So um, at some point, you may want to have a board of directors. I've found that having a good board of directors 
uh, in advance of you know planning before a sale is extremely helpful to getting everybody focused and accountable. Board of directors should be holding the executive team accountable. In a small single founder company, rarely do you set up a board of directors. Usually they set up board of advisors, which is giving advice. You might only need one or two people to help you though. And that's really a question of what do you need to help you grow to where you want to be at your exit. Awesome. Uh, um, Antonio, do you want to just ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Spencer. Hey, Wayne, uh, regarding 1202, uh, have you experienced some, uh, uh, investors more interested when an LLC switches to a 202, especially in the tech industry. Uh, what's your take on that? You can't switch to a, from an LLC to a corporation and and qualify for 1202 unless you sell the assets. If, yeah, if can, a, a transfer of assets. I mean, when you do yeah. that, uh, I'm doing that for a client in California right now. We we're they they see the value. They're building a platform that's in a very uh, uh, old industry, but the platform is, is, you know, it's like an Uber based platform. And so it's technology. And so they, they understand that they may have the ability to sell the company if it's successful and an extremely high multiple in the future, if they build this out and grow it right. So we're actually uh, selling assets from an LLC to a Delaware corporation that will qualify for QSBS, but the top, the clock starts ticking on the sale date, not on the original date that you formed it. So what it does though, is it's converting something that might be subject to tax at, you know, 20, 23.8 plus state income tax, 13.3% in California, all the way up to zero if it qualifies for QSBS status. And so if you sell the stock and the gain is under a certain level, um, you don't have to pay capital gains tax. Yay, people love that. So that's that's a valuable exclusion, but it's it's uh, it's rife with uh, traps for the unwary. You gotta be really careful about how you structure stuff. I hope that answered your question. Yes, uh, I have another question if I may with that one uh, because of what you commented. Uh, if Let's say you have investors that came into the LLC and then you transfer the assets to a C Corp in Delaware, then the the the, the clock starts ticking when you transfer to or, or when you become the C Corp, right? Yes. Uh, does that include the previous investors that came with you in the LLC? If you gave them stock in the new company, yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank if you. If you don't give them stock in the new company, no. Okay. Yeah, so, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Free tax advice. There you go. But you uh, get what you pay for. Is that what you said? <laughs> That's right. You can't hold me liable for anything that I say on this call. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Let's Any take one more, one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, come off mute if you've got Oh, it. somebody asked if the book is on audio. Oh, yeah. I, I narrated it. I almost went horse doing it. Um, I did it back in April of this year. And it is available on audio, on Audible. And it's also, we're running a promotion, I think, through today, maybe tomorrow, that you can get it on Kindle for 99 cents if you have Kindle. So, uh, but otherwise, you can get a hard copy of the book and uh, or Audible. And uh, the if you get the Audible version, you want to download the, um, the, uh, the diagrams and some of the other stuff that I refer to in the Audible version that's in the book, you know, examples, checklists, things like that. It's all on uh, waynezell.com. So you, you can see all the all the uh, downloads from uh, the book that are there as well. This is great. Thanks, Wayne. Hey, uh, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. And thanks everyone for coming on. We'll see you all next week at 11. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thanks, Wayne.